Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, the premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a Difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 419 of our pharmacotherapy series which discusses neoplastic disorders and their treatment, general principles. The next case reads. BBC is a 39-year-old male with aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma, abbreviated as NHL. At the time of diagnosis, BBC had enlarged cervical lymph nodes, dyspnea, and a large mediastinal mass noted on chest X-ray examination. Chemotherapy was initiated with rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone, abbreviated as R-CHOP. After the first cycle of chemotherapy, BBC's lymphadenopathy was greatly reduced. Chest X-ray examination repeated after the second cycle of therapy showed marked improvement. When he returned for his fifth cycle of chemotherapy, recurrent lymphadenopathy was noted and the chest radiograph confirmed enlargement of the mediastinal mass. So my question to you is, why is BBC's cancer growing despite continued chemotherapy and how should his treatment be altered? Most likely, BBC's cancer is now growing because the tumor has become resistant to the chemotherapy. Therefore, it would be wise to discontinue the current regimen. Biochemical resistance to chemotherapy is the major impediment to successful treatment with most cancers. Resistance can occur de novo in cancer cells or develop during cell division as a result of mutation. In 1979, a proposed mathematical model known as the Goldie Coldman hypothesis predicted that tumor cells mutate at a rate related to the genetic instability of the tumor. Thus, the probability that a tumor mass will contain resistant clones is related to both the rate of mutation and the size of the tumor. Many mechanisms have been identified by which cancer cells resist the activity of cytotoxic agents. Some cell lines that become resistant to a single chemotherapy agent may also be resistant to structurally unrelated cytotoxic compounds. This phenomenon is called pleiotropic drug resistance or multidrug resistance. Cell lines that display this type of resistance are generally resistant to natural product cytotoxic agents such as the vinca alkaloids, antitumor antibiotics, epipodophilotoxins, camptothesins, and taxins. The primary mechanism believed to be responsible for multidrug resistance is an increase in efflux transporters such as P-glycoprotein in the cell membrane. These proteins mediate efflux of the chemotherapy agent, causing decreased accumulation of drug within the cell and decreased cytotoxicity. Other transport proteins, e.g., breast cancer resistance protein, have been implicated in resistance to chemotherapy as well. Another type of multidrug resistance is resistance caused by changes or mutations of drug targets, for example, 
the altered binding of topo I summaris 2, an enzyme that promotes DNA strand breaks in the presence of anthracyclines and epipodophilotoxins. Because of the likelihood of multidrug resistance, BBC should receive a chemotherapy regimen that does not include agents transported from tumor cells by the multidrug resistance mechanism. An alternative regimen such as gem c bean or oxaliplatin, with or without rituximab, may be a reasonable option, because this regimen is active against non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and these drugs are not known substrates for various efflux transporters. Regarding tumor site, the cytotoxic effects of chemotherapy agents are related to the time the tumor is exposed to an effective concentration of the agent, i.e., concentration multiplied by time. The drug dose, infusion rate, route of administration, lipophilicity, and protein binding can influence the concentration time product. Other factors, such as tumor size and location, can also critically affect an agent's cytotoxicity. As tumors grow larger, their degree of vascularity lessens, making it more difficult for agents to penetrate the entire tumor mass. Tumors located in sites of the body with poor drug penetration, e.g., the brain, may not receive a sufficient concentration to provide effective kill. Regarding pharmacogenetics, Anti-tumor activity and adverse effects of chemotherapy agents are associated with the presence of genetic polymorphisms that can affect the metabolism and disposition of drug. The next case reads, KMK has newly diagnosed stage 2, bulky Hodgkin lymphoma. She initially presented with asymptomatic lymphadenopathy, night sweats, and a 15% weight loss in the previous two months. KMK is to begin chemotherapy today with doxorubicin, bleomycin, vinblastin, and dacobazine. All of these chemotherapy agents have activity in Hodgkin lymphoma. So my question to you reads, why is it recommended that KMK receive all four drugs, rather than just one drug? Although single-agent chemotherapy can cause significant early regression of Hodgkin lymphoma, acute lymphocytic leukemia, and adult non-Hodgkin lymphoma, some tumors show only a partial, very short response to single-agent therapy. In Hodgkin lymphoma, the use of combination chemotherapy results in long-term, disease-free survival for more than 60% of patients. If KMK were to receive single-agent therapy, her disease would not be cured. Combination chemotherapy is recommended to provide her with the best chance for long-term, disease-free survival. Combination chemotherapy provides broader coverage against resistant cell lines within the heterogeneous tumor mass. Several principles provide the basis for selecting the agents to be included in a chemotherapy regimen. 1. Agents with demonstrable single-agent activity against the specific type of tumor should be used in combination therapy. 2. Agents in the regimen should have different mechanisms of action. 3. Agents should not have overlapping toxicities so that the severity and duration of acute and chronic toxicities are minimized. 4. Agents in the regimen should be used in their optimal dose and schedule. Subsequent chapters will provide examples of commonly used systemic regimens in the treatment of hematologic and solid tumor malignancies. Primary treatment is the first line therapy and in certain tumor types may be referred to as induction therapy. 
Choice of primary treatment is governed by observations made from clinical trials that demonstrate that a given regimen has the highest known activity against the tumor. These regimens may include chemotherapy, targeted agents, endocrine agents, or biologic response modifiers. Second-line treatment is administered after the tumor has become refractory to primary therapy or if the patient is unable to tolerate first-line therapy. Systemic therapy is frequently used in different ways during the course of an individual's malignancy. Primary treatment can be either curative or palliative, depending on the specific type of tumor. After primary therapy, Patients may receive additional treatment in an attempt to further eradicate residual disease and improve their chances for long-term survival. This treatment may be termed consolidation, intensification, or maintenance therapy. See subsequent chapters for specific discussion of the use of primary, consolidation, or maintenance therapy in the treatment of hematologic and solid tumor malignancies. The next case reads, FTR, a 58-year-old woman with no other medical problems, recently underwent surgical resection for stage 3 ovarian cancer. She has been told that she currently has no evidence of cancer. However, she also is told that she should now receive six months of chemotherapy. So my question to you reads, why would chemotherapy be recommended now when she has no detectable disease? Micrometastases or residual disease may still be present in some patients after primary treatment. These patients have a high probability of disease recurrence, even though the primary treatment may have successfully removed all visual evidence of the primary tumor. To eradicate any undetectable tumor in these patients, systemic therapy after initial curative surgery, or radiation therapy, may be recommended. Systemic treatment administered after primary therapy, in the case of FTR, primary therapy was surgery, is referred to as adjuvant therapy. Because the tumor burden is relatively low at this time, adjuvant therapy should immediately follow primary therapy. For adjuvant therapy to provide benefit, the risk of tumor recurrence must be high, and effective agents must be available to eradicate the tumor. Adjuvant therapy is considered standard of care for some stages of breast, lung, and colorectal cancer, but it also has benefited selected patients with ovarian cancer, Ewing sarcoma, Wilms tumor, and other malignancies. The duration of administration of adjuvant therapy varies depending on the type of cancer being treated and the drugs being used, but is typically several weeks to months in duration. See subsequent chapters for specific discussion of the use of adjuvant therapy in solid tumor malignancies. FTR will receive adjuvant chemotherapy with 6 to 8 cycles of carboplatin and paclitaxel. Because it is difficult to detect micrometastases or residual disease, it is a challenge to determine which patients should receive adjuvant therapy. To help with these decisions, clinicians frequently consider histologic and cytogenetic characteristics of the primary tumor that are associated with high risk of relapse. Neoadjuvant therapy is given before the primary treatment, typically surgery or radiation, in patients who present with locally advanced tumors, e.g., large tumors or those that are impinging on surrounding vital structures, that are unlikely to be cured with primary therapy alone. The objective of neoadjuvant therapy is to reduce the tumor mass.
thereby increasing the likelihood of eradication by subsequent surgery or radiation. Neoadjuvant therapy also can lessen the amount of radical surgery the patient needs, which can preserve cosmetic appearance and function of the surrounding normal tissues. The tumor can be resistant to neoadjuvant therapy and continue to grow, however, making surgery or radiation even more difficult. Patients may also experience toxicities with neoadjuvant therapy that may delay surgery or impair post-surgical healing. Locally advanced tumors in which neoadjuvant therapy has been shown to improve survival rates include non-small cell lung cancer, breast cancer, sarcomas, esophageal cancers, laryngeal cancer, bladder cancer, and osteogenic sarcoma. See subsequent chapters for specific discussion of the use of neoadjuvant therapy in solid tumors. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video which will be part 420.